Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. This is our third year of doing Stanford EMX. This is the beginning of a new academic year. We are delayed by a week because of people's travels. Everyone's traveling again, but uh, we think there is still great value in continuing to communicate this way by having our seminar joint uh, biology and physical sciences. So we will have uh, fewer uh, talks uh, this year, but we hope to attract people whom we might not otherwise be able to see uh, because of the travel restrictions in the past and the ones which are still present in some countries. But uh, there will still be a regular uh, meeting. We're trying to aim for the first Monday of the month. The next one will be the first Monday of December and we'll have one on the second Monday of January like we did last year. And then we'll proceed from there. And we've been talking about having a possible live meeting which will be broadcast, uh, which uh, everyone can attend either in person uh, but that will be uh, or uh, online, but that will be uh, next uh, spring. Anyway, we are continuing with our joint uh, biology, physical sciences uh, presentations. And so without any further ado, I am very pleased to ask my colleague, Professor Wachu, to introduce the biology program and uh, our speaker today, Peter Peters from, from uh, the Netherlands. Wa, wow, please. All right, thank you very much, uh, Bob. Uh, it's welcome everyone to our first academic uh, seminar series. It's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce my very uh, dear colleagues, uh, Professor Peter Peters, who is a university professor uh, at the Maastricht uh, University in the Netherlands. And Peter is very well known, uh, Yechang Microscopy, who pioneered a lot of different techniques for cellular microscopy. In particular, he has introduced this uh, cryo-immunogo Yechang Microscopy uh, method, which has now become the gold standard for ultrastructural detections of different protein at the subcellular levels. And uh, he also contributed a number of very novel discovery in biologies, including the identification of a protein called ARF6 as a regulator for endocytosis. And also he uh, did, did a lot of development in understand the, uh, the, the process of tuberculosis. And in addition to contributing to a lot of seminal uh, science and technology in biology by using electron microscopy, he has been devoted a lot of his time in, uh, in supporting uh, po postdoctoral career development, uh, which he has been a dean uh, for, for more than a decade in, in the Netherlands. And uh, back in um, 2011, uh, he established the, the Netherlands Center for Electron Microscopy. And now that uh, center has become part of the EU roadmap of large research infrastructures. And uh, since uh, some not long ago in the 2014, uh, he co-directs the current uh, Maastricht uh, Multimodal Molecular Imaging Institute and which has been uh, aimed at developing both uh, novel technologies and also education. So it's my great honor to introduce uh, Peter, Professor Peter Peters, who will bring us to a really important topics uh, on understanding the invisible hands of sample vitrification for X-ray and cryo electron microscopy. And he's the invention of a new machine called VitroJet. Peter, welcome. Thank you very much, um, Wa and Robert, for inviting me to this uh, Stanford uh, series of lectures in electron microscopy. And it is really a pleasure to speak for biologists as well as non-biologists. So I try to make it as, a, as, as attractive for both communities. 
Many of you know that there are already vitrification devices uh, on the planet for many years. The developments uh, go back to early uh, 70s, I think. But uh, later it was uh, Jacques Duboucher who invented the method for vitri vitrifying a thin layer of uh, protein in a sample or viruses in a sample of a solution. And that was called uh, plunge freezing into a, eat, into a liquid eating. And um, that machine, that idea later was commercialized uh, and, and further developed in our university by my predecessor, Peter Frederick. In addition, you have the high pressure freezer uh, that can uh, vitrify bulk tissue and um, non-life science material like a gel type of structures and polymer soft, soft material. And I like, like today to talk about the jet vitrification principles. And for those who have no idea what vitrification is, but I'm sure everybody knows, it's a rapid cooling of an aqueous medium into a glass-like amorphous solid that is free from any crystalline ice. And by preparing a sample like this, you can then make the sample thin and do microscopy without having the damage that is caused by the ice crystals. So, as I mentioned, Jacques Duboucher was the one who did the invention and got the Nobel Prize for that to vitrify material for the biology community. And uh, Frank Naples and Peter Frederick developed this idea into a machine that you can see here. It's already on the market for a long time, I think. It has not been changed in the last 10, 11 years, except minor, minor modifications. And about 1,100 uh, groups worldwide are using this instrument right now. Our university uh, gets a license for the for the commercial uh, product, and we were able to pay Frank Naples for a few years to develop a new device that we worked on in the laboratory about six years ago until three years ago, and then it became a commercial product that went to a small startup company that I will discuss later. Very nice to tell you is that the current vaccine was based on the structure of the spike protein. The spike protein of COVID has a particular configuration. And for designing the best uh, vaccine uh, based on the structure that was revealed, uh, three uh, modifications were introduced in the mRNA, resulting in uh, three Pauline uh, residues in the structure to keep the protein more stable and therefore a better uh, antigen for vaccination and more immunogenic. So in this way, cryo-EM contributes to uh, real serious issues currently happening in the world and for many other diseases, of course. So the Vitrobot principle is based on a putting in a large droplet of three microliter of your protein purified on a copper grid, then you use filter paper to blot, and then you have a very thin layer of material on the grid that you then plunge in liquid eating. There are others who developed an instrument where you have a spray of small droplets that go to the grid. And we, uh, uh, in the last few years, developed a principle of pin printing. So we have a pin and we have a very small distance to them, to the grid, and we have a droplet in between and we write and we get a, a sample on the grid this way of a very thin layer. And then uh, rather than using a plunging, we use uh, jetting. So plunging is taking a forceps and have a naked copper grid and just plunging it into liquid eating while we already make use of an uh, clip ring that is uh, around the grid. And in this way, you can take a gripper and this gripper can then handle uh, the, the grid and can vitrify it. And because of the jetting principle, you cool down the center first. And from there, the temperature goes to the periphery and cools down also the, um, the, the clip ring. And in this way, you don't need to clip the copper grid afterwards while that needs to be done here, introducing contamination. But more importantly, when you plunge, you create a little bit of space of air in between the liquid and the grid, resulting in not so good vitrification. 
So we did that uh, with a prototype machine uh, that uh, is can be seen on a last year's presentation that I give at Stanford for those who have more interest in the old prototype. I show you soon the new instruments, but we were able to test several proteins and uh, got a quite high resolution from taking on a relative simple 200 kilovolt instrument in our laboratory, the Arctica, um, getting uh, in this case hemoglobin uh, as a structure uh, with yeah, a quite good resolution with such an instrument. So we uh, published this work uh, in Nature Communications, and for those who have interest, you can have a look at it uh, later. Uh, there is, and I need to disclose that, competing interest, because we uh, patented uh, several of the, the aspects of this uh, instrument. And um, in contrast to people who develop software for the electron microscopy community and give it away publicly, that is not possible when you... Um, make these kind of inventions because it will never ever become a product. And therefore uh, I initiated a company and became the CSO of this company and I'm a shareholder. And um, here you can see uh, the instrument that is currently available that goes uh, worldwide, 20 have been sold. These are the 20, the, the, the people that um, developed the instrument and here are many more engineers that helped to make this machine even better. So for one minute, I have a commercial head on and I show you the, the, the cryosol instrument that is currently available on the market. As I said, 20 have been sold worldwide and so we are fixing them now, making them even better. You can see there uh, the different elements. You take a pro purified protein solution and here is the pin drum. The pin drum has uh, 12 pins and you take uh, one pin that is uh, meant for the writing. Uh, you have uh, 12 grids, auto grids already ready to use. You go to a glow discharge device in the instrument to make clean it up and make it hydrophilic. You take a nanoliter or less of medium, you write on the grids, and as fast as possible, you try to vitrify this by the jetting principle that I mentioned earlier. And then it goes to a cassette where you can keep it uh, for months to go until you want to put it into the microscope. Um, and you can see here a container that contains liquid nitrogen and in there is the liquid uh, ethane cassettes. So um, I like to show you the principle of the writing that you can see here because we have many cameras in this instrument. And in this way you can monitor precisely the principle of the writing. And then you can see uh, here uh, a copy of one particular moment in the writing. You can make from these movies uh, hundreds of images, and then you can see what happens in time and check the uh, thickness of the thin layer. And this is a more or less 40 nanometer, and you can uh, select uh, enough squares to collect data for overnight uh, screening. You can also take a, a, a picture one second later, and if it becomes thinner, you have evaporation and you will immediately notice this. If you have condensation of water, it becomes thicker. So uh, that is both bad, and you need to work precisely at dew point in a uh, special controlled climate chamber. And so these are the elements that are in there. But we are talking here still about an old fashioned uh, copper grid. This instrument is also meant with the idea to get away from copper grids and to go to more modern devices, uh, the MEMS devices. And uh, we are working on it in our laboratory in Maastricht, but also my colleague Arjen Jacobi uh, is working on it at the University of Delft in the Netherlands. And he published recently in eLife a very nice paper where he shows the nanofluidics chip for cryo-EM structure determination using even less than a nanoliter. He is using a picoliter of volume. So here is a two by two uh, millimeter chip that goes into a copper uh, ring that goes into the microscope. This thing has a, a way to fill here at this particular site. Uh, this picoliter of volume goes to the center. Here is the center. And there you have small channels. And if you look to one small channel, you see one here, 
that has no um, no open uh, contact to the surface, so uh, the liquid will go uh, along this uh, tunnel, and uh, then you can later uh, record your images here at this particular site. And he did this for several proteins, and here you can see the result of three of them, and he achieved in a site entry gel microscope quite reasonable um, results with this uh, brand new uh, principle. So this one could be introduced into the VitroJet as well and make, we are aiming for mass production of these MEMS devices. And then we have no water air interface and perhaps less damage. And more importantly, later you can do nanofluidics with two different channels or more and mix them in time and get then um, 4D cryo EM so that you in time see the biological phenomenon of two different components meeting and seeing how they interact or adding a drug or whatever you like. If you like to read more about this, and I can't cover it all in this short time, I invite you to read a review that we published last year, Understanding the Invisible Hands, published in uh, Nature Methods. So uh, I would like now to shift gears from purifying single proteins or whatever particles you want to study, because we have also many material scientists to show interest in uh, looking to all kinds of nanoparticles and they move on a grid and they rather vitrify them. And so they consider now also the vitrojet as a way to, um, to, to use this as in a way to uh, analyze. Also people who want to study green or all kinds of other, uh, let's say, um, non-biological samples uh, can be analyzed via this system. But we as biologists, but also people in material science would also like to look in situ to particular components. And so then you need to get rid of the purified protein that you have purified uh, in your laboratory before you vitrify. Now we look to the entire cell. And so the entire cell is growing on a gold grid. Copper is toxic. And so the cells will grow overnight on a gold grid. And then and the next day, you can then uh, vitrify these cells. And the current procedure is you take the, the, the gold grids, you vitrify it via the plunger. So you use the old fashioned vitrobot with the filter paper and you remove most of the liquids. And hopefully you have then still cells present on your grids. And after that, you need to do the clipping as I mentioned earlier. And this procedure is not so trivial because gold is very sensitive to bending and it breaks very easily. So you have very often many cells that are just broken. And then the remaining cells that you have are in the periphery, but also they are very often very badly frozen because plunging uh, is possible with 50 nanometer, but actually it doesn't work when you have 10, 10 micrometer thick cells. And that is what you see here on this grid. And that was even mentioned in a great paper that Julia Mamahit in the Baumeister lab at that time published in Science, where they indicate that um, the lamellae that I like to discuss later, um, they are um, transparent only in the periphery and that the cells undergo incomplete vitrification. Uh, and thus they avoid the, the details deep in the cell and only look in, into the into the small areas where they make lamellae. So that was for us an extra insp inspiration to see whether we could use uh, the VitroJet or a potentially new device rather than the old VitroBot to go into this workflow. So this workflow is you have cells growing on grids, you vitrify them, and then you do cryo light microscopy, you make lamellae, and these lamellae are thin uh, lamellae, as you can see here, of a particular bacteria in this case. And then you see elements that you can look at in detail after you have made your tomogram in one of these uh, microscopes. So we tried that with the VitroJet. That machine with this pin printing is not the best for that because it can does not really fit into a laminar flow cabinet. And you want to work with, let's say, all kinds of genetically modified cells and bacteria and viruses. So it needs to be in a biosafety level two or three level with, uh, in the laminar flow. And so we took 
the jetting principle out of this machine and build a very small jetting device on top because vitrifying cells is actually much simpler than vitrifying uh, a very thin layer of protein. So in the lab, uh, Remo Ravelli, who is a colleague and a, and a principal investigator, and uh, Anavia Premiera, who is a graduate student in our team, worked together with me and several other colleagues to develop this instrument. And I'd like to show you uh, in a movie what, how, what the current state of the art is. Here you can see already the machine in the workshop. And here you can see a camera that can make the movies of the jetting principle. And later you see the results of those. So the idea is to take this container with the nitrogen and the ethane, build this, and have the electronics underneath the laminar flow cabinet. Here is such a laminar flow cabinet. And so we have that now working. It is here in, already in the laminar flow cabinet. And we modified the jetting principle to keep the cells warm until the moment of the jetting. Uh, and then we have also uh, an element to uh, align the, the system so that whenever you put the, the, the top on the, the jet, it is precisely in the center so that you can vitrify cells, but you can also, also vitrify proteins in a solution that are hanging in a loop. And this very small loop is used for the X-ray community to vitrify proteins that are already in the form of a crystal, a protein crystal. So I'd like to show you later results with these three. And here is the, the little cup that you use to uh, store uh, these samples once they are vitrified. So here you can see the moving. Uh, you take uh, your cup and you put the cup uh, into the liquid uh, a nitrogen container on the left. Um, it works with a magnet, like all the other devices that you hang in there. So uh, now it uh, goes into the liquid nitrogen container. It fills up, and later you have your sample in there. Here is already the loop, and the loop there can take a solution, for example. In the solution can be a protein or cells, or whatever you want to study. We use it to optimize the system. So now we go down and we jet freeze this loop that contains a particular solution. And then we carry it to the left to deliver it to the liquid eating. And from there, we take the cup out. And now we have the loop plus the vitrified sample into liquid nitrogen. And then we can place it into the either microscope or the X-ray beam. So for the loop, we use the X-ray beam, and for EM grids, we use, of course, the uh, microscope. So the principle of the jetting, you can see here a little bit. You, we have the jet stream coming from the bottom, and it goes to both sides, as you can see here. And so the, the ethane level is here, and we jet in this particular area, and immediately after we have uh, jet, um, the, 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 the grid or the loop, we bring it down for more cooling. And once it is cool, we take it out and immediately we bring it to the liquid nitrogen. Here you can see the principle of the jetting. So from left and right, you can see in 17,000 frames per second, the jetting principle. And so if we have a loop in the center, the idea is to vitrify the sample without blowing it out. And that happens at the moment in about 80 of the 100 cases. So sometimes it is not precisely centered. And then the, in the loop, the, um, the liquid goes out either to the left or to the right. So we have it almost optimized. And many are of good quality, 80 out of 100. So that is uh, quite an achievement because you come from both sides is one atmosphere of a liquid uh, ethane jet. And we think actually that when you come from both sides at the same moment, that just before you jet vitrify, you uh, actually, uh, before you hit the sample, is already vitrified. A new feature that is possible also is now to uh, have UV light at this moment before you jet, and that is actually. Uh, 
microsecond before it is touching. And this way you could do very nice, uh, all kind of uh, UV induced click chemistry. And that is uh, something that we would like to do for the future, not only for the biology community, but also for chemists. And uh, so non, the non-biology uh, community could use this as well. So uh, here you can see what we have at the moment. We start with uh, 20 degrees Celsius, and then we go down. Uh, and that is a very rapid uh, vitrification. And then we keep it uh, at very low temperature so that we don't get into cubic ice or ice crystals. And then we store it here in liquid nitrogen at the end. So it took a long time before we were able to achieve this, but now with all kind of insulation, we have it uh, up and running very nicely. So from now on, you can imagine that you can also bring this to higher temperature, to whatever. 30, 60, 90, 100 degree material scientists want maybe something at 200 degree and then vitrify. That is uh, also possible. And that we do with uh, MEMS devices again, where you have heating elements in there and um, they can come from dense solutions, which makes these devices. Um, I come back to this moment in the next slide. So we here um, looked at uh, pressure versus uh, velocity. And as you can see, if you go from an 0.4 bar to two bar, you increase the velocity. And we found that actually one bar is the best in for our process. And um, here you can see some pictures of the jetting again. So here is the device to measure the cooling rate. This is a um, MEMS device that comes from another Dutch company from Delft. It's called Dense Solutions. And the material scientists know this because Dense Solutions makes MEMS devices to study catalysis where you have in situ in a microscope at 200 degrees Celsius, a particular process that you can follow in time. We discovered that these devices also work very nicely at very low temperature. And so you can easily imagine that you can not only have it here at whatever 30 degree, but also 40, 50, or precisely 37 degree, where cells are happy, or 39 degree for temperature sensitive cells mutations. And then here you have the vitrification measured by this device. And this very small uh, distance here is here seen better. And then now you can see the actual cooling rate. And we measured that this is about 3 million Kelvin per second. And we are talking about an auto grid that contains the clip ring already. Compared to the Vitrobot, where you have worked with naked grids, they have a cooling capacity of 40 in the heat robot. So you have almost an, well, incredible amount of more vitrification capacity. And so that is uh, good news. We thought this is also useful for people that do X-ray work, uh, not only for people that do uh, work on cells. So we decided to look to all kinds of uh, solutions. Um, here we have a loop that we vitrify. And in the loop, we have, in this case, 20% glycerol. And what we found that if we do the jetting, we can see in uh, all the samples that we jet vitrify, uh, very nice, the pattern that is supposed to be seen when you have a vitri sample. And when you plunge 20% glycerol, you can see here the water ice crystals uh, in, in these two cases. Also, if you look to movies, you can see uh, here the, the rings typically for uh, crystalline ice. And here, when you jet freeze, you can see the pattern that is um, precisely as you can expect from amorphous ice. So we also try this for uh, a protein, a protein purified, crystallized, crystal, and the crystal is seen here. This crystal is, in this case, lysozyme, but you can take any one that you want. And we vitrify this now without any cryoprotectant. Usually, X-ray people need um, cryoprotectant in order to vitrify uh, crystals. These cryoprotectants may have side effects. They may distort a little bit the crystal. But in this case, we can vitrify the sample just in a salt solution without adding any cryoprotectant. And as you can see here, 
you get uh, the beautiful pattern, the diffraction pattern that comes with the um, X-ray results based on the crystal that is formed in this particular protein. So um, that gave us a good, uh, let's say, information that this is going to be useful for the X-ray people. And this work that I just showed you here is to optimize the system, make the jetting better, try all kinds of conditions to vitrify cells, and uh, then not use the microscope that takes too much time, but use the X-ray. So we send every month, now at the moment, 100 samples to Grenoble and do X-ray work overnight, and we get the, the, the data back next morning. Another element that I would like to discuss is the clip ring. I mentioned already that we like to grow cells on gold grids, but the clip ring is copper. So you cannot put this uh, in the culture system because copper is extremely toxic. Already in one, two minutes, cells are suffering. So you need at the moment to uh, take gold grids, vitrify them, and then clip them afterwards with the plunging. But then you break them, as I mentioned. So we like to use now uh, gold grids that have titanium outer grids. And we made them here nearby in a workshop. And uh, they work exactly like you see here. And we grow cells overnight on titanium, which is also used for in the body, yeah, for surgery in the bone. And we compare the titanium outer grids with copper grids. And the copper grids overnight, all cells die. You can see here the dead cells have a different color. And with titanium, all cells are happily growing overnight. And so this is a much better way to... Um, uh, start the procedure of making cryo-electron tomography by vitrifying these. Here you can see cells that grow on the titanium versus copper. Here they are dead and here they're happy. So we are aiming for these cells. And here you can see the result on a gold foil of mammalian cells growing uh, on these uh, gold foil grids. And we have really significantly improved uh, this procedure by uh, the, all the elements that you can see. I will not go into the detail. It takes me too much, but we have no cracks. We have beautiful vitrification. It is much easier to make a lamellae of these uh, vitrified cells because they are amorphous. If they have crystalline eyes, it takes longer time. So the making the lamellae is, uh, more for most of you probably know, it's also well known in the material science community. In this case, imagine you have a cell uh, but you can also imagine green or a kind of a polymer that is on a grid. You make thin lamellae, and that is uh, done via a procedure that was a bit modified by the Bram Koster group in Leiden, where you have, uh, let's say, to avoid that these will break easily, some extra security gaps here. And then uh, once you have these uh, lamellae, you can um, get them at the moment at uh, on average, I think, 130 to 160 nanometer. Uh, and they are um, at, uh, in this case, I think, a two by two micrometer. But uh, currently, you can make these new machines from Thermo Fisher overnight. I was told 130 of those uh, lamellae automatically. You don't need any more somebody taking care of those. We did this with cells that grow on, on, on gold grids. These cells were, um, before they were vitrified, cultured in the presence of bacteria. These bacteria were uh, taken up by the cell. And so you have inside uh, white blood cells that phagocytose these bacteria, bacteria deep inside. And then we wanted to study those, uh, um, those uh, bacteria in the context of the membrane inside the cell. We gave also the bacteria, uh, we gave the cells also not only bacteria, but also gold particles, BSA coupled to gold, so an, in protein coupled to gold. And these gold particles were also endocytosed and phagocytosed. They are present all over the cell in all the endosomes. And they are later used to align the tomogram. So here are the gold particles that you can see. They're always present in the lumen. They're never in the cytosol. And these are very useful for aligning a thin lamellae. Rather than having gold on the cell or on the, 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 the carbon. Here you can see the bacteria, the inner and the outer membrane of this bacteria. 
so that you can see here too. This is the inner outer membrane, and this is the membrane of the phagosome that you can see here around. So this is the stomach of the mammalian cell that is eating these bacteria. These bacteria, they cause, for example, diarrhea in the intestine. They do that by injecting toxic components into the host cell, and we want to study that mechanism, how they actually connect and perturb the integrity of the membrane of the host so that the toxic components go into the cytosol of the host cell. And here you can see one of those uh, secretion systems. And if you collect a few hundred of those, and hopefully in the near future, a few thousands with all those lamella that you can make, we needed, we needed one year to, to collect, I think, uh, probably uh, 200 of these uh, uh, secretion systems, but now it goes automatically much faster. You may get much better resolution than we show here, but this is the principle. You make a tomogram and you collect all these subvolumes, and after a few hundred, you average them, and then you get structures like you can see here, where you can see all kinds of components in there. But we won't go into the biology too much. I would like to leave it into the methods development. And so I think I have spent enough time talking uh, about what we have been doing in, in terms of method development. And at the end, I would like to acknowledge all the people that worked in the lab for the Vitrojet for cells, Navia, Raymond, Carmen and Kevin for the tomograms and uh, the, the bacteria, uh, Casper, and then many others in the lab who contributed to this work as well. Pascal did a lot of work with his colleagues developing the instrument in the engineering department. Frank, who used to work in our lab, moved to Cryosol together with Bart and René, who came from our lab. They are now uh, in Weert, which is nearby Eindhoven. And uh, Julia also moved to uh, Weert from our lab. And Aaron, Emil, and Ben. Ben is the CEO, and Emil is the COO. And these are two well-seasoned uh, FEI people who used to work for 20 years developing the Polara and uh, many other elements in the microscopes. And now they run this beautiful um, company in Weert. And I hope I can continue working there when I'm retired. I'm 65, so in a few years, I hope I can spend my time here making more progress in uh, development for cryo microscopy. We work with Demcon to develop these instruments, and we get money from the province and, and from the Dutch Science Foundation, and this all at our university. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm eager to uh, answer questions, and I give the word back to Wa. All right, Peter, thanks very much. These uh, phen phenomenal methods uh, that would uh, make the vitrifications of all kinds of material much simpler and more efficiently. So there are some questions uh, on the Q&A. The first question is about the cooling with the ejecting method. Would it cause uh, the eyes to crystallize at the periphery uh, because of the temperature gradient? No. We have no. looked all over the grids and everything uh, remains amorphous. Okay, sounds good. No. All right. And then the second question is, is it possible to determine the thickness of the eyes when the grid is still inside the ritual jack? Or do you need to use a microscope to determine the thickness of the eyes? Uh, actually, we can uh, determine in the vitro jet with high accuracy uh, the, the, um, the thickness. So I can go back to this particular slide. We are developing the software uh, for uh, optimizing it. But uh, here you can see numbers. And these numbers represent uh, gray levels, and mm -hmm. these gray levels represent the uh, ice thickness. Mm -hmm. So the camera is of that quality that uh, this black and white camera that is now put into colors mm -hmm. that, that you can very accurately, um, and we are now with people at the EMBL and also in Ulich, um, determining how reproducible this is. So they, they make tomograms or they use their uh, field emission gun to measure the thickness in the microscope and we compare it to the colors that we have here on this particular spot. Okay. 
Uh, I want to have a follow-up question since you have the movie here. Uh, so during the writing, you only write it on part of the grid. So what's yeah. the prospect of writing in a bigger area because the grid area is a three millimeter? Yeah, so we have many people who ask this question, whether we can uh, occupy more. And so I think that this is an uh, 80 uh, micrometer large pin. And now we move to an uh, 840 large micrometer large pin. And that can cover a larger area on the grid. So I think we occupy two thirds of the grid if you want. We uh -huh. cannot go larger than that. I see. Otherwise we will damage the clip ring. Okay. So Is... we have now reached the maximum size, more or less. I see. Is it possible to write more than one type of sample? Yeah. So um, at the moment, the software is not there yet. But indeed, you can imagine that um, uh, oh, oh, rather than uh, maybe I have a grid here somewhere. Oh, yeah. So before we uh, here, for example, we, we can imagine that you write one protein from left to right and another protein from top to bottom. And they will mix in the center, and then you will get from there a gradient to the periphery. So that can result in mixing two proteins. That's a matter of changing the software. It's not yet installed. But if that question comes, it is very simple. OK, so in a sense, you can possibly do a, a biochemical reactions on the grid as well. Yeah. And also UV light uh, is at the moment we have a few instruments where uh, uh, the customers ask us to have the UV flash just before you uh, go to the vitrification. I see. All right. So there's a question about the, the cell thickness uh, for vitrifications. Uh, how thick the cell can be in, to be vitrified in your method? Ten yeah. Yes, so the, 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 the amylase crystal was 300 micrometer. And that, in the absence of cryoprotectant, was completely amorphous, as I showed you. Mm. And that is a very reproducible result. So amylase crystals in just water with some salt right. can result 300 micrometer. For um, cells, uh, we are very eager to start looking to organoids. Half of my work is actually with Hans Cleavers on organoid in my lab. We have been there on the organoid field since the beginning. And I love to go into organoid work and lift out procedure of organoids. And uh, so we are aiming for, um, um, in the beginning, 100 micrometer, not to be too optimistic. Uh, I'm afraid 300 is too much. High pressure freezing would work at 300 micrometer. So I, I, I would like to disclose that the high pressure freezer is there. But then you need to include the organoid into a medium of dextran. And then you later need to mill away all that or you trim via a diamond knife and a cryomicrotome a lot away so that you have a very sharp little tip in the organoid that then you can use for making um, lamelle. These, these things are already ongoing at the EMBL and in Martenschried, I know. I see. So that means these potential can replace the high pressure thing, high pressure freezing. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. That is uh, what I'm aiming for. I see. That's convenient. So uh, one more, there are many more questions, but uh, let me just uh, raise a couple more. How is the cooling rate measure? Um, so the cooling rate was measured with a MEMS device. And the MEMS device, uh, I invite you to go to the to the to the side of dense solutions, um, and so uh, here is the, the 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 image. So, in that machine that I showed you uh, in the in, in 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 the movie, we can place rather than a loop or rather than a grid, we can place this device. And this device is at the bottom a MEMS device, exactly like I showed you with the result of Arian, eh, with the nanofluidics. But in this case, it has um, in, um, two metals that are going to be very thin. I think they are about 25 nanometer thick. And they connect. And so then you can measure that way. 
Okay, good. Okay, really one more last question. We have to move on to the next speaker. The last question is, what's the time interval between the sample deposition and vitrification in the vitro gel? Yeah, that question I also get almost uh, each time. And I can only say we get uh, faster and faster uh, depending on the software that we have. So we, we know that this is a critical thing and uh, we are aiming to make the software better and that will make it uh, better. But we will always have to deal with the fact that our outer grid is touching um, in, the, in the heating elements to, to control the temperature of the grids while writing because we don't want evaporation and no condensation. And it needs to be a dew point. And then it needs to detach from the heating element and then goes to the jetting. So this will take some time. But I was told that the preferred orientation of a protein, because that is why this question is asked, is um, so fast that whatever we do, it will you will never solve this problem. And that's why we think that the this idea that I mentioned earlier, uh, with the, the MEMS device will completely overcome this because in here you have your proteins and you don't have any more water-air interface. And that is what Arjen has shown in this particular thing. So then in our vitro jet, it won't matter how long it will take. Okay. So good. this is a right. preliminary work of this year, but very exciting. And uh, we will continue to push this further. Okay, absolutely, Peter. Thanks so much. And Peter will stay online after the second lectures. And yeah. uh, there are many more questions as so please stay on. And I turn my floor back to Professor Bob Sinclair. And Bob. one more thing, you, you, we are eager to answer questions later. If people collect the questions, we can yes. by email answer them. Yeah, they were all in the chat box and you can answer it uh, one at a time. Thank you. All right, good. All right, Professor Sinclair. Thank you very much, uh, Wa and Peter. And uh, to transition to the physical sciences, then uh, uh, this is a very intriguing approach. And uh, to adapt it to uh, materials problems like uh, lithium ion batteries to freeze them or, or nitinol stents and to see the phase transformations, I think uh, the, there would need to be some uh, adaptation. Uh, to the different types of materials and the thermal conductivities and the masses involved. But it's a very, uh, very intriguing approach for us in material science as well. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, normally I hand the, the baton over to uh, my colleagues, uh, either Professor Jen Dion or, or Professor Yi Che. But uh, because people are beginning to travel again, they are currently giving talks in different places simultaneously. So I am left with the great pleasure and honor to introduce the physical sciences uh, speaker. Uh, even though I myself am traveling, uh, this is not my normal home office, as you might have seen in previous EMX. I'm currently in Singapore, and over my uh, 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 shoulder, you might uh, be able to see in the background the uh, iconic building uh, of, uh, of Singapore, the Marina Bay Sands, uh, lit up a little bit, um, which is, um, since it's now uh, 11 or 11.45 p.m. Uh, at night here. Anyway, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Colin Ophis, uh, who has been at the uh, National Center for Electron Microscopy at Berkeley. Uh, both uh, Wa Chu and I originated from Berkeley, as it were, and so we're very glad to have another Berkeley person to, to give a talk here. Uh, Colin's been there for 10 years or so, is widely, uh, uh, widely recognized as probably uh, the person most responsible for introducing 4D STEM uh, techniques. Uh, there's a, a paper which he, review paper which he wrote for I think microscopy and microanalysis, which is I use in my classes now, which is a classic already in the field after two or three years. Colin uh, was awarded the Burton Medal of the Microscopy Society of America this year. And so it seems uh, doubly appropriate that Colin uh, gives, opens our uh, 2022 academic year uh, series of EMX. So Colin, please uh, let me hand it over to you. 
Uh, thank you so much, Bob. Uh, can you see my slides okay and hear me okay? Looks good to me. Perfect. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to give this seminar. I'm very excited to do so. And I also want to thank the previous speaker. And, and like Bob said, uh, count me among the material scientists who are very interested in using this technology to look at soft matter, look at battery samples, electrolytes, things that are, are very, very prone to damage in the electron microscope. So today I'm going to be giving a talk on 4D STEM, the technique that Bob mentioned. And so as a brief outline of my talk, I'm going to introduce both scanning transmission electron microscopy and the 4D variants of it here. Um, give you a sort of a quick introduction, a crash course on analyzing diffraction patterns since it's gonna be relevant for the rest of my talk. Then I'm gonna show some material uh, uh, sciences examples, measuring things like local strain, deformation of materials, the orientation of crystals, uh, strain mapping uh, um, and phase mapping both for crystal and amorphous materials. Then I'm gonna go down to the atomic scale and show how 4D STEM can be used to push the resolution and sensitivity down to single atoms in 3D um, solving structures. And of course, no computational microscopy talk would be complete without a little slice of deep learning just to show you where the field is going and uh, the type of tools that are coming online now for processing data. And then time permitting, I will show you a little bit of the sort of software side of my lab development. These are open source codes that we developed to make it very easy for people to uh, analyze their own data, simulate their own experiments, etc. So just before I actually get started with the main content of my talk, Bob mentioned that I'm at uh, uh, Berkeley Lab, specifically at the National Center for Electron Microscopy in the Molecular Foundry. This is an open access user facility. Anybody on earth can submit a proposal. And if you're accepted, uh, you have access to our instruments, to our staff, to our software. And it's not just NSAM. We also have uh, floors like biological nanostructures or inorganic chemistry or nanofabrication. It's sort of a one-stop shop for nanotechnology research. And unfortunately, our proposal uh, um, uh, uh, cycle just closed this month. Um, but if you're interested in anything I show today, remember, if you get a proposal accepted, I have to write analysis code for your scientific problem. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to jump right into the introduction. The scanning transmission electron microscope is an extremely flexible materials characterization platform. Uh, it's more or less displaced high resolution PEM, the sort of technique, the plane wave phase contrast imaging technique that biologists primarily use uh, in the field of material science. And the reason is it's much more tolerant for thick samples, for strongly scattering materials, for heavy elements, et cetera. Whereas the plane wave imaging methods uh, um, tend to be better for weakly scattering materials like we saw in the previous uh, um, talk there. So the electron microscope looks a lot like a light microscope. We have electron sources. We have some condenser lenses to set up the illumination. We possibly have an aberration corrector uh, and then a very strong objective lens to get our probe down to the size that we want, even subatomic scale. And then we enlarge the resulting diffraction pattern with a projector lens and then make measurements. So labeled here are a couple conventional uh, detectors. These are, are used often simultaneously or even simultaneously with spectroscopy to do, to do sort of imaging analysis. And I'll show a couple quick examples of that, although not a lot in this talk. Uh, more interesting to me, at least, is the advent of these pixelated detectors. And these were eventually or originally introduced primarily for biology to, to give much better electron sensitivity to measure biological nanostructures. But we use them to measure the full diffraction pattern of the, of the sample. Um, but I also want to call out uh, spectroscopy, electron energy loss, um, you can collect backscattered electrons, uh, secondary electrons, EDX signals, the sort of X-rays generated by uh, electron uh, um, ionization events, and other in-situ holder samples. We saw a temperature measurement in a, in a dense solutions MEMS holder in the previous talk. So I just want to sort of give you a feel for what this instrument really looks like and all the different techniques that you can use. And I think the Stanford Shared Nano Facility is actually getting a spectra installed uh, um, in the next couple of months that can do, uh, I believe, all of these techniques, except for possibly the secondary electron um, capture. So the, the technique that I want to talk about, though, is 4D STEM. So conventional imaging using a converged electron probe passing through the sample used a sort of giant monolithic single pixel detector. And then we would move the probe to the next position, collect electrons, move the probe to the next position, et cetera. But these days, our detectors are so fast, we can use a pixelated camera record a full two-dimensional image of the diffraction pattern at every probe position, step to the next probe position, et cetera. So the result is a two-dimensional grid of probe positions and at every probe position, a two-dimensional image. 
giving the name of this technique 4D stem because of the 4D data. So what we, why would we want to do this? Here are two examples from the Cornell lab of a conventional imaging experiment on single uh, layer thick moly disulfide. And you can see the conventional incoherent bright field and annular dark field in A and B respectively. You can sort of make out the atomic lattice. You can vaguely tell what atom spots are the molybdenum and which ones are the two sulfur atoms. And on the right-hand side in the Fourier transform, you can see the resolution of the technique. If you switch to phase contrast imaging, in this case, something called center of mass differential phase contrast imaging, this is akin to what the biologists use. It's much better for weakly scattering materials. Um, but it doesn't really push the resolution of the technique. It boosts the signal to noise because it's much more dose efficient. But you can see the, the maximum uh, Fourier components there are about the same as the incoherent methods. But if you instead use the image of the probe to fully deconvolve all of your aberrations in your probe from your sample, you can see both a dramatic increase in signal to noise and in resolution. And so this is from the Cornell Group's uh, uh, nature paper here showing sub 0.5 angstrom resolution of moly disulfide. And you can see where the red arrows are, where a single sulfur vacancy occurs, it's much, much easier to measure such phenomenon if you uh, um, have a much clearer, higher SNR image like we see here. So that's on one extreme length scale. The other extreme is ultra large fields of view. So what we want to do in the sketch I'm showing here, for example, uh, um, of a solid state battery stack, is we want to be able to scan the entire one micrometer thick, a thousand nanometers or 10,000 nanometer thick stack, and be able to get diffraction patterns from all the different regions. And because these uh, diffraction patterns come from essentially nanometer sort of scale uh, projected areas here, they give you atomic scale information about the local material structure. And what we, when we have this data set, we can then analyze it in many different ways. We could record the conventional dark field or bright field images, things like the phase mapping, degree of crystallinity, local deformation, structure class certification or orientation, or even more exotic channels, for example, electron beam induced current uh, um, shown here. So these are sort of the two, two extreme length scales that I'll show in my talk today. Um, one last note is this data, this technique is extremely data intensive. This is uh, one of our first uh, K2 detector experiments in 4D STEM, the one from the review paper that Bob mentioned. And each one of these patterns is actually an average of 40 by 40 probe positions. Here's a more realistic tableau showing an average of seven by seven probes, but you could just imagine the extreme scale of this data set here. It's over 400 gigabytes of raw data. And this is what we used to record in three minutes. With our modern detectors, we can record a data set like this in under six seconds. It is, it is unbelievable how much data our cameras can generate now. So our, our biggest challenge is data manipulation and analysis. Um, okay, so I mentioned a quick crash course in what exactly these signals contain. This is an example, a toy model showing a converged electron probe diffracting through three crystalline grains. And you can see that, that what we're essentially measuring is a selected area diffraction pattern, but the area is the intensity distribution of the probe on the sample surface. So we're, we're essentially measuring a convolution here, multiplying the probe intensity by the sample potential. And then in the far field, it's in Fourier space or reciprocal space. So we get a diffraction pattern here. And these patterns act as fingerprints for the local material, its orientation, its deformation, et cetera. Um, now, unfortunately, electrons scatter very strongly, so it's often complicated by multiple scattering of the beam, and I'll return to that later. So for amorphous materials, you see something very similar. If I take this toy model and I randomly displace all the atoms on the right-hand side and then scan through it, you can see we can go from a nice square perfect diffraction pattern to these characteristic amorphous halos. But the interpretation of the pattern is the same. We're measuring a diffraction pattern where the illuminated volume is the projected area of the probe on the sample surface. And uh, similar to the crystal materials, what we call these amorphous halos here are a unique fingerprint for the local structure of the material. And this can be used for things like short range order mapping, medium range order mapping, or even strain mapping as I'll show in this talk. Um, and I mentioned that uh, uh, multiple scattering complicates crystal diffraction. It's perhaps even more of a detriment in amorphous materials here. These are very, very challenging to study. Um, so let me show you an actual experimental example. This is a user project, gadolinium titanate, perfect single crystal. They put it next to a reactor, ion irradiated it, and this amorphizes it down to a depth into the material. Then they pop it into a furnace to anneal it and you regrow from the crystalline uh, front into the amorphous region, but you also nucleate all of these randomly oriented crystallites here. 
And so the parent crystal had pyrochlor structure, but the recrystallization is much more like fluorite. And these recrystallized tiny grains in the middle that nucleate are, are fluorite as well. And so well, how do I know that? Well, I know that from the diffraction patterns. So we only record one of these images at a time, um, but I'm just sort of showing the, the scan of five of these beams as we pass through the material. And you can see these sort of fingerprint crystalline diffraction patterns in characteristic amorphous halos, as I mentioned in the previous slide. So once again, if you look at the sort of tableau of this, you have single crystal pyrochlor, recrystallized fluoride, a sort of a mixed amorphous and polycrystalline fluoride region, a mixed area, and then at the surface of the film, this fully amorphized zone here. So this is about a micrometer field of view here, square, give or take. And, and this is why this technique is, is gaining favor in material science for problems like this, because we can scan arbitrarily large fields of view and still get atomic scale information. So in the rest of the talk, I'm not gonna really speak about our, our synthesis of the samples or the experimental data collection. My area of research is very much in the data analysis here and simulation side of it. And in particular, our software code, pi 40 sim as I mentioned, is what we use to analyze a lot of these uh, materials. Um, so let's uh, uh, jump into some material science examples. The, the crystal strain mapping I mentioned, the principle is quite simple. If I look at a toy model where the lattice is in compression, atoms closer together on the left and further apart on the right, and I scan through it, you can see that the response is the spacing of these, of these diffracted spots changes, and we're in reciprocal space. If the lattice atoms are closer together, we have uh, further apart spots in Fourier space and vice versa. And so if we can make a high precision measurement of that spacing, we can measure the local deformation of the material. So in that uh, uh, pyrochlor sample I showed previously, here's the index diffraction pattern in the single crystal uh, pyrochlor region. And I'm just showing the strain in the vertical epsilon xx direction, the horizontal epsilon yy direction, and then the shear strain, the xy here. So you can immediately see some interesting features that red line in epsilon xx running vertically, that is precisely where the amorphization front reached into the material. And you initially uh, recrystallize with a lot more disorder, and then it settles down within about a five or 10 nanometer area, and you grow these recrystallized fluorite uh, grains here. And if you measure the local infinitesimal rotation, you can actually see very much uh, on the left, uh, no rotation of that front, and on the right-hand side, this sort of blue and red grains. And this is because when you nucleate, you often have misfit dislocations, and it will grow outwards into the amorphous phase with a couple degrees of random orientation from the parent pyrochlor structure. So another example, this one is from Will Chu's group, uh, a collaboration at Stanford, actually. They take these lithium iron phosphate particles and they do synchrotron studies as they delithiate the material here, as they change the, the potential voltage across these grains. So these are primary cathode particles of lithium iron uh, phosphate, um, showing colored by the different amounts of lithium. And this is done at the um, cosmic beam line at Berkeley Lab. It uses a TEM sample holder. So we can pop out the grids, the three millimeter grids, put them into our instrument and do 40 stem measurements of it. And it's a little bit thick. The diffraction patterns are a bit messy here, but you can see once again, from the spacing of these spots, we can easily measure the lattice constants. So I'm showing on the left or the right-hand side here, the, uh, um, the uh, essentially the A and the C direction strains and then the shear strain at the bottom right. And so once we have these data sets, we're, we're scanning the same pixel by pixel uh, uh, particles here on the exact same particles. And we can align this data. And then we have uh, a feature space representation of the local lattice constant, A and C of this material and the lithium content. And so what we did in this paper is use machine learning uh, techniques here to essentially derive the constitutive relationship between composition and strain. And so this is more of a proof of principle than anything, but it shows the sort of power of multimodal characterization here, especially when you can mix and match between X-ray and electron techniques. So I hope that a lot more X-ray beam lines in the future go with TEM sample holders and TEM sample grids, because I, I anticipate seeing a lot more of these multimodal studies in the future. Um, I, I mentioned amorphous materials. One of the things we have to do in our, in our um, experiments is calibrate ellipticity. It's very difficult to align the diffraction patterns perfectly on the optic axis. And if you're misaligned in the condenser projector system, and then you take a polar transform of your data, 
you can see these characteristic wavy lines here. And this is because of the elliptic distortion. So we have codes to fit this ellipticity and then be able to do a polar elliptical transform and recover the, the diffracted spot uh, uh, scattering vectors with much, much higher precision. So for example, here, if you don't do the correction in black, you get this sort of peak doubling uh, multiple scattering vectors. And if you correct it, you get a much sharper, uh, much more accurate and precise uh, diffraction pattern. So this is very helpful because I already mentioned amorphous materials generate an amorphous halo. What we can do is use the exact same code to fit the characteristic amorphous halo, the nearest neighbor shell, essentially. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's sort of what it corresponds to. And then once we have that fit, a little bit of linear algebra will give us the strain tensor. And we can't measure the infinitesimal rotation because if you rotate an ellipse or a circle, it looks almost identical, but you are able to get the other three components of the infinitesimal strain tensor. So here's an example uh, um, on a bulk metallic glass material in an in situ straining experiment. So this is the unloaded configuration, the fully loaded configuration, and then after we break the material. And this was a very interesting observation that we weren't expecting. Uh, after you break, you actually have about a third of the total strain left over as residual. And so this is sort of uh, um, the equivalent of plastic flow, but in a bulk metallic glass. The, the pulling on this material, the, the sort of deformation of it has caused irreversible changes in the nearest uh, uh, neighbor spacing and next nearest neighbor shell spacing, which is sort of what we're picking up here in these materials. Um, and so going back to the gadolinium titanate, if, if you remember, we had that mixed amorphous polycrystalline on the middle of the field of view and the right-hand side, the fully amorphous region. And this is showing those strain tensor measurements of those two zones. And you can immediately tell them apart. It, very interestingly, if you look at the strain fields in the mixed region, you can actually see the sort of red and blue, especially red though, banding around a lot of those holes. Those are where large polycrystalline grains nucleated. And because they have a different atomic density from the amorphous phase, they pull on the, the local atomic spacing in the amorphous region and change the, the local atomic spacing, which we can measure with this method. Uh, okay, so one more strain example here. This one's a little more involved. If you take bilayer graphene and you take the second layer and rotate it with respect to the first layer, you get what's called a moray lattice. And so if I just pause it here, you can see that we have this repeating unit cell, this moray unit cell in this material here. Um, and these, these sort of twisted bilayer materials have a whole host of interesting electronic properties. I'll just mention one, the sort of very famous magic angle superconductivity paper here. Um, and a ton of work followed this up to sort of model these in simulation. And one of the predictions that came out of a lot of the modeling and simulation papers is that the AA stacking, of course, uh, where carbon atoms are directly on top of other carbon atoms, very unfavorable. AB stacking, where, where you have a um, one third unit cell shift, that's the graphite structure, it's very favorable. And so a lot of authors predicted that there'd be a local relaxation where the material would try and maximize the AB stacking and minimize the AA or BB stacking. And so we set out to measure this experimentally. If you do a dark field TEM experiment on your sample grid here, this is just showing one of the dark field beams, uh, I think 11 bar 2O, or, or sorry, 11, uh, 0, 01 bar O, or 11 bar 2O. You can already make out the more lattice. The dark bands are where you get destructive interference between the lattice, and the bright bands are where you get constructive interference. So you can use dark field TEM to map out the lattice structure. Um, but with 40 stem, we can go one step further here. So here are a couple different 40 stem images from our data set here. And it's sitting on a boronitride substrate, which we've masked off in black dots. But if you look at the innermost and outer or second ring of the, of the graphene diffraction spots here, you can locally measure whether you have AA stacking, AB stacking, or one of the saddle point edge stacking. And these sort of unique fingerprints here uh, um, can give you the local stacking. And if you do this over a, a large sheet of this material and then pull out all of those seabed patterns, the convergent beam electron diffraction patterns, we came up with a mathematical way to, to transform this into a displacement map to sort of ensure local continuity over the two lattices. And, and the result of this is a, a displacement map as a function of the Moray twist angle here. And so you can immediately see uh, we've labeled here in white the AB stacking and black the AA stacking, the response of this material as it, as it locally deforms to maximize AB stacking and minimize AA stacking. Um, 
Displacement, of course, is just the, the integral of strain. So if you can smooth these images a little bit, differentiate them, then you're able to get the local strain tensor. And this is the infinitesimal rotation tensor after subtracting the Moray rotation. And what, we're, what we did is we measured the deformation unit cell by unit cell to get a lot of statistics here of the local uh, Moray cell deformation. And this one was very interesting because we actually identified two different regimes where it sort of uh, uh, counter rotations inside the Moray cell or shearing at the saddle point boundaries. And I don't have time in this brief talk to go into the mathematical details, but if you're interested, uh, I would encourage you to check out our paper here. Um, so one last uh, uh, material science example, orientation mapping. We stamp bullseye probes into our, our patterned uh, uh, electron apertures here in order to more easily measure with, with high precision the diffraction pattern positions. This is a gold uh, uh, silver palladium nanowire. And this is the all the diffracted spots scanning over the whole field of view. And then after the elliptic calibration I mentioned, um, we, we've in pi 40 stam written this crystal orientation mapping code to essentially fingerprint all of those diffraction patterns and determine the most probable or second most probable or third most probable orientation, and then do orientation mapping in a 40 stam experiment here. And so this is just showing the results for this uh, um, uh, sample here. And you can see all the many, many different nucleated polycrystalline grains in the sort of helical nanowire structure here. And I think I have a couple slides, yeah, showing the 111 uh, uh, planes that are perpendicular to the beam. But even more interestingly, the shared 111 planes between adjacent grains. And one of the hypothesized formation uh, uh, mechanisms for this material is that it was twinning along 111 planes that leads to this sort of helical structure. And we found a statistically significant number of these sort of shared 111 planes. And so the next step in this experiment would be to tilt the sample and, and repeat at many different tilt projections to try and get a full 3D orientation map of all of the grains here. Um, we, I, I mentioned our interest in soft materials. So this is a small uh, uh, molecule, sort of polymer-like structure. If you, if you look at the diffraction patterns of these materials, you see almost nothing. You really have to enhance the contrast to be able to see the diffracted Bragg spots. And the beam very much destroys this material. Uh, uh, so we have to take about a 10 nanometer step between adjacent probes into undamaged material to be able to characterize them. But we are able to see uh, um, the sort of primary diffraction spot here. This is the pi pi stacking of this material. And then uh, uh, use data uh, analysis methods here to reconstruct the macrostructure of these samples. So what do I mean? Uh, uh, so this is the T1 small molecule sample, the reconstructed morphology. And this is the same material, but adding a DIO additive to break up the grain structure. And then I'm just showing an animation here, scanning the raw experimental data below here. And so you can see if you don't have the additive, you have these large continuously turning domains here. Um, and there are a couple grain boundaries here, but very much uh, uh, minimized. Whereas if you do this additive, it breaks up the material and you have a lot of overlapping crystalline grains and none of this sort of continuous rotation here. So the pi pi uh, uh, mesostructure of this material is very strongly mediated by adding this material. Um, so this is just to sort of really emphasize why we do these techniques. Here's the conventional HADAP imaging uh, of the material without the additive and with the additive. And you cannot see anything. You can see the carbon grid, the sort of lighter uh, 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 contrast regions there. But other than that, there is no morphological uh, information about the sort of sample. But if we replace that with the 40 stem measurement here, we get this rich picture of the local structure of this material after it's been spun onto the, onto the grids here. Um, and for my money, my favorite features are these disclination singularities. You go in a circle around the, the singularity. The diffraction pattern doesn't rotate 360 degrees. It only rotates 180 degrees. And so these are well known in the liquid crystal uh, um, literature here. And so here's just a reference from uh, the McKay uh, textbook. Um, yeah, so I'll show, I think, one more uh, orientation example I guess I have here. This is a, a uh, um, ink printed material that a user brought to us. And so in this material, we did our full 40 stem scan. We measured all the innermost diffraction ring spacings here. This is the basal plane of carbon. And we're able to get an orientation of these carbon basal planes. But the hypothesis was uh, um, in, the, in the darker gray regions here where the glue is, the sort of hollow regions of this material, that the basal planes would be aligned to those uh, um, holes essentially. And so in order to do that, we did a bit of data analysis, found where all of the voids were, and, and where all the carbon uh, uh, regions were, calculated the, the normal derivative of those materials and pulled out the boundary orientation map. 
And if you subtract those from each other, you get the relative orientation between the carbon basal plane and these hollow pores. And so I'll just zoom in to show colored in green, zero degree orientation between, between the pore and the wall here, and in purple, 90 degree orientation. And you can see a strongly, uh, very statistically significant orientation relationship between the carbon basal plane and these open pores here. Uh, okay, so I will show you uh, um, one more quick experimental example, but this is tychography of atomic resolution materials. So uh, we are able to solve the position of every single atom in 3D by doing these atomic electron tomography experiments. And traditionally, they're quite high dose. We record many, many images at different projections and then use computer algorithms to reconstruct the structure in 3D. And then we trace out all the atomic coordinates. And then uh, a lot of my uh, group's work is to pull apart these sort of data sets and then measure things like the local internal grain stacking, chemistry, uh, um, what have you of these materials. But there's a, a, a problem. This imaging method that we use for all of these studies, high angle annular dark field, this incoherent method, very dose inefficient. So I already showed you at the beginning of the talk that tychography can do better. And so here's an example that we just published that's sitting on the archive, it's currently under review, uh, of a nanotube, carbon double wall nanotube, with a zirconium telluride nanowire in, encapsulated inside the tube there. And so here are our tilt series here, and you really have to do the tychography to get the dose efficient imaging at all these different angles. If you use the incoherent imaging, you would absolutely destroy the material here. And so after we did that, in order to boost the signal to noise, we did some class averaging, taking a page out of biological studies, and then reconstructed it in 3D, this sort of class average structure here. Um, then we fit the carbon nanotube and traced out all the zirconium and tellurium positions inside this volume here and uh, uh, discovered quite a rich, very interesting internal nanowire structure. And so here's just a quick sketch pulling apart the different layers here. Um, but I just wanted to mention the overall structure. It has this known zirconium telluride uh, uh, five uh, um, structure, but instead of forming a continuous crystal, you have on each side four individual units here that are rotated about 25 or 26 degrees with respect to each other. And they sort of form a, a shell of the nanowire. And then inside, we found this zirconium telluride two structure that had never before been observed. It has a very sort of unique atomic arrangement here, uh, remarkably actually similar to the zirconium tellurium five. And so these are the type of structures that we could never have solved with the conventional incoherent atomic electron tomography. And our, our fast detectors and 40 STEM experiments let us move to tychography and let us solve these structures. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes of my talk here, I just want to show you where we're going with these uh, um, analysis methods. So a lot of our diffraction patterns look really clean and you can identify all the circular Bragg diffracted disks and then use conventional correlation disk detection to measure all the spot locations. This is a simulated data set. So black is the ground truth and red are all of the determined positions. But what if you don't know your material ahead of time and your lattice parameters are a lot smaller, you have overlapping disks, you have multiple scattering inside the disks, you get really complicated diffraction patterns. If you use the conventional methods, they completely fail when you're trying to analyze diffraction patterns like this. Um, and so what my group wanted to know is could machine learning methods help us overcome this barrier? So we take the materials project and Aflow lib databases, we pull in every crystal structure known we simulate hundreds of thousands of these diffraction patterns. We apply uh, you know, elliptic distortion, limited signal to noise, uh, um, inelastic plasmon backgrounds. And then we train neural networks to invert from these really, really complicated diffraction patterns back to the underlying structure factors. And so I'll just show you one of our architectures here, the FCU net, the Fourier space complex unit, um, not that different from the units that you would find in the literature. It, it takes in uh, uh, the diffraction pattern and the probe. It operates in Fourier space with a complex activation layer and spits out these sort of atomic potentials or structure factor slices projected into 2D. Um, and so if you, if you apply this to simulated data sets here, comparing it to the conventional correlation disk detection, where the ground truth again is shown in these blue dots and the measured positions in the black crosses, it, it does such a better job. It's, it's remarkably better. And if you take these lattices and you measure the strain fields from them in an automated way, you can see you get about a threefold increase or fourfold increase in the accuracy. So you're reducing the systematic error by going from correlation to machine learning. And it's remarkably uh, uh, dose resilient too. So if you use less than a thousand electrons per pattern, our correlation methods essentially don't work, but the machine learning can operate down to only a hundred electrons in each diffraction pattern. 
Uh, and so if I return to those two simulated examples, you can see that the deep learning network just has no problem whatsoever. And a, a part of this is because it has seen every single crystal structure that is known essentially from these databases. So we can encode a huge amount of prior knowledge into these networks. So I'll show you one experimental example, 100 nanometers thick of silicon and silicon germanium multilayer stack. And if we do our 4D stem scan, and then we use correlation or, or the machine learning method to measure the dispositions here and then calculate a strain map and compare them. Uh, this is the result. So this is the EELS uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy of this material. Once we know the precise germanium content we can use for guard's law to solve for the local lattice strain. And that's what I've colored in black here. And if you compare the correlation to the SE unit complex measurement here, it's like night and day. The, the uh, um, Correlation method just has, uh, it's affected by tilt of the sample, it's affected by surface oxide, it's affected by noise, it has all these systematic errors. And in the other direction, the epitaxial direction, it's equally bad. And these results are actually out of date. We retrain the network about uh, once every couple of weeks to improve these results. And so the results in the paper are even better than these slides. Um, Okay, so in my last uh, 10 seconds here, I will just mention that all of our codes are open source. They're all available for free. You can pop onto our tutorial repo or our regular repo here. And all of our examples are in things like Jupyter Notebooks. I showed you that orientation mapping of the gold, silver, palladium nanowires. This is sort of showing loading in the notebook, looking at the diffraction patterns, the maximum diffraction pattern, calculating a probe kernel, do the correlation disk detection, a little bit of hyperparameter tuning, uh, matching a few example diffraction patterns, and then spitting out the orientation maps here. And so all of this is, all the data sets are freely available. We've scaled them down to make it so anybody can run them on a laptop. Um, and if you're interested in this type of analysis, please do check out our repo. Uh, and so just as a quick example of what you can do, where you could do orientation mapping of the synthetic data set here, where, where you pull out the local orientation of the reference crystal and then measure the deformation of each one of those grains from the reference. So combining orientation and strain mapping. And these are the sorts of multimodal uh, uh, 4D STEM studies that we're moving towards. Um, and, and so I'm just gonna wrap it up by mentioning, uh, as Bob said, I wrote a review paper on 4D STEM, which you can find in microscopy and microanalysis. Uh, uh, I already mentioned uh, Pi 4D STEM available on GitHub and the tutorials, perhaps even more importantly. And I also uh, um, work in STEM simulation. And here is my STEM simulation code where you can simulate these imaging or diffraction experiments and possibly soon spectroscopy, although we'll see about that. Uh, and I want to acknowledge all of my many, many, many collaborators here, including a lot of people at Berkeley Lab and other institutions who've contributed to our analysis codes here. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much, Colin. Um, you know, sometimes I think that um, you're taking part of the fun of, well, maybe it's because uh, you're a, a theoretical guy, you're taking part of the fun away of being at the microscope, because you can collect all this data uh, with your 4D STEM technique, which you can then spend uh, days or months analyzing afterwards. That's true, Whereas but imagine doing days, this analysis. In the old days, uh, we had to do the experiments uh, uh, on the microscope and think about what, to, how to get the, the most valuable data. That part's still true, though, right? You need, you need uh, uh, it's garbage in, garbage out. You need a great sample and a great data set to do these experiments. That one of the things we want to do is bring these analysis codes to the microscope so you know what you're looking at. You could do the phase mapping, the orientation mapping, or do the, the virtual imaging right there on the microscope. Uh, I think that's going to really help with the feedback loop of data collection and, and analysis. Super. We'll look forward to that next year then, Colin. Uh, I have uh, just one question before we go to the Q&A. Um, you talk about uh, diffraction pattern. Um, maybe you, you're using the term um, perhaps a little bit loosely in terms of uh, what sort of probe sizes are you using typically? And uh, does that, uh, that would presumably limit the uh, resolution of any um, dark field uh, information which you got uh, from, from uh, subsequent uh, uh, processing the data? Yeah, that's actually a very good question here. So the, the answer is every probe uh, size under the sun. So if you, uh, um, if you, if you want, sorry, I just want to, uh, if you want to do atomic resolution imaging, you can show mathematically that if you have your center spot and your diffracted spot, 
when those spots overlap and create interference between the adjacent diffraction disks, that's where the atomic resolution scattering comes from. And so if you want atomic or, or subatomic resolution, you want a very large convergent semi-angle, usually in the order of 15 or 20 milliradians. Um, and that would be the sort of current generation of microscopes. Next generation aberration correctors will let us push it out to 30, 40, 50, maybe even 60 milliradians. Um, but most of the experiments I showed here, we don't want atomic resolution modulation of the patterns. So we use convergent semi-angles that are very, very close to touching, but not quite touching. And that's usually about four or five milliradians. And that will give you a resolution of about a unit cell, give or take, one to two unit cells. Um, and so that's what we use if we really, really need high resolution in real space. Um, but I would say it's becoming even more popular to use much smaller convergent semi-angles. So when I, uh, um, I think it's, uh, uh, let's pull ahead to the orientation mapping here. This convergent semi-angle is about 0.25 uh, um, milliradians here. And so we're talking about very, very small scattering vectors. Um, and we've since machined our own apertures that we actually give away for free to anybody with an electron microscope that go down to 0.1 milliradians uh, um, uh, using standard microscope settings. And so that would form a probe in real space that's somewhere in the ballpark of five nanometers. And so what I'm really getting at to answer your question is we tune it to the experiment at hand. Some of our experiments with 0.1 milliradians, 100 microradian semi-angle, it's basically just like conventional selected area diffraction. You have a very a parallel electron beam. Um, wh whereas if you push the convergent semi-angle out to four millirads, almost touching, the tails of your probe will reach out about plus minus one and a half, two uh, um, unit cells of the material. And if you want subatomic resolution, you can push your probe down to an angstrom, half an angstrom, something on that scale. The flexibility, the tunability of being able to set the convergent semi-angle is one of our key advantages. Um, and so maybe one last note, I will say there's no free lunch. These bullseye probes make the probe tails larger. So you lose spatial resolution if you if you stamp an amplitude pattern into the probe. Uh, so I guess my answer, Bob, would be it's complicated. <laughs> right. And I, I was thinking more about the, the probe size rather than the, um, the convergence angle. But of course, that's another variable. Oh, yeah. They're reciprocally related, right? So larger semi-convergence angle, smaller probe size. Yeah. Um, there's a related question here from Dr. Lanke, which is uh, asking, which I know that you have addressed uh, in the past, about uh, why you would use patterned or, or specific um, condenser apertures uh, for the strain mapping. Ah, that's a good one, actually. So we have a paper on this in Ultra Microscopy, uh, where Steve Zeltman is the first author here. The patterned apertures are, are in particularly what we use for thick multiple scattering materials. Once you're above 20 nanometers or above 50 nanometers for, for lighter elements, and, and sometimes we go as high as even 300 nanometers, as you saw for our samples, you get a lot of contrast in your diffracted disks. And so if you stamp this pattern into it, you have these hard edges that we can use to detect the position of these disks. And so it, it essentially, it improves the precision of measuring the disk positions, and it helps you identify them above uh, um, a noise floor. And I don't actually have those slides, I think, included in this talk, but uh, we've, we've shown you can get uh, between five and 30 times improved accuracy by stamping this sort of pattern, uh, these bullseye apertures into the probe. And, and so if you just search for bullseye aperture ultra microscopy, um, you can see all of our detailed sort of studies of this. And as I mentioned, anybody who has a TEM who wants a free set of apertures, we make these and give them away for free. So please do feel, for, feel free to email me. And the apertures we make have four bullseye apertures on the grid and four circular apertures. Most FEI scopes only go down to about 10 micrometers, but we've machined a 20 micrometer, 10, five, and even two micrometer circular aperture to improve the flexibility of the instrument. Um, Terrific. Uh, thank you. And thanks for letting us know about the availability of those things and people can email you. Um, rather than a uh, question from the same uh, uh, respondent, uh, going on to Dr. Sloop's questions about, um, I don't know if you can see the q and A. It's uh, fairly yeah, long, but it has to do with um, uh, getting uh, the, uh, uh, doing a, uh, an analysis on the diffraction patterns of an amorphous 
material and uh, traditional ways to do radial distribution functions. So how can you combine the radial distribution function analysis with, with your data? I suppose you could um, integrate uh, your data and then uh, obtain the radial distribution function or, or maybe some other way. Yeah, the, the, that is precisely true. So I don't actually have an RDF example here in this talk, but I can show you, uh, um, where was it here? In the elliptically uh, uh, corrected thing here, one of the reasons we do this elliptic correction, where was it? Sorry, bear with me one moment because it will help to pull up the slide. Ah, here we are. The uh, radial distribution function mapping, you take patterns pretty much just like this, although you usually want to use a very small semi-convergence angle so that you don't uh, um, interfere with the probe. And so what you're seeing on the on this sort of radial integral, this is a crystal material, but you can do radial distribution function mapping for amorphous semi-crystalline or crystalline materials. This red curve is what you want to generate. This is the diffraction intensity as a function uh, um, of the scattering vector here. And what you do with this pattern is you subtract out the single atom scattering form factor, which you fit, and then you're left with what's called the reduced structure factor of the material. Then you take a type two sign transform, and that gives you a real space uh, um, image of an RDF. And so that would look something um, like uh, this. Uh, you're, you'd, you'd create a distribution as a function of R, where you have your, your reduced uh, radial distribution function, G of R, your probability here. And it's asymptotically approaching one, where this, this is constant density of your material here. And so this curve I've drawn is what radial distribution function or short range order mapping would give you in an amorphous material if the specimen is thin enough, right? And if you, if you look at the pattern that I'm showing here, this crystal material, you'd get something uh, uh, much sharper because your, your Fourier components go out much further. So you'd, you'd actually pick up a lot of your crystalline scattering out to very, very high angles here. And then a fully liquid sample might give you a radial distribution function with a single maxima and then just flat after that. So all of these tools are built into Pi40STEM right out of the gate. And all you have to do is find the center of your position or patterns, do the elliptic correction, radially integrate it, and then just do the RDF analysis here. And that can be done probe position by probe position. Um, the complication is our RDF mapping works reasonably well if the sample is below, say, 10 nanometers, 20 nanometers, but most materials that we look at are thicker than that. And so we're investigating using machine learning to remove the multiple scattering from these patterns right now. So I, I actually think it's going to be a huge growth area of using the electron beam to study disordered materials. And it's something we're very much working on right now. But all the conventional material uh, um, analysis methods like uh, RDF analysis and fluctuation electron microscopy, FEM, they are built into 540 STEM if you want to try them out on your data. Right. Uh, my, my own tuition, intuition is that thinner samples uh, would give a, a better structure analysis because of the projection problems, yep, uh, but yep. that's just my intuition. No, so, that's exactly uh, right. Actually, Bob, uh, uh, Amelia Liu, who wrote a physical review letters paper on uh, symmetry mapping of amorphous clusters like decahedral, icosahedral. I asked her how she got such great data, and she told me, make a sample that's four nanometers or thinner. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty funny to hear, but she's right. Yeah, well, so we love those four nanometer samples. <laughs> but, 2D um, materials. So, oh, yeah. Right. So, so uh, former president uh, of MSA, John Mansfield, has a comment saying, uh, thanks for the plug for microscopy and microanalysis, but uh, the, the paper stands by its own on its own merit, uh, but he says, uh, could he see Jonas Moody lines in some of your seabed patterns? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, maybe. I, I, I mean, which, which, John, which, uh, uh, um, which data set were you referring to specifically? Well, um, I'm not sure if he, I, if he can get online, but. Um, uh, yeah, he's in the Q and A here. Uh, Q &A. Um, the answer we, is we maybe. Can, we can, we uh, should follow up later on that. I would say. Yeah, and uh, uh, we can, we'll send you the Q and A to answer. Sure. So one last question, since we're running out of time here, Colin, it was um, uh, from uh, 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 Dr. Kosciuklu from uh, what what kind of typography uh, ah. are you referring to? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so th yeah. this bit that we showed here was focused probe tychography. So we do both. We do both defocused uh, uh, probe tychography and focused probe tychography. But it's kind of a fuzzy line, right? Because depending on how 3D the sample is, you might have parts of the sample that intersect where, where the probe is very small and parts where it intersects very large. It, it depends primarily on what detector you have. So we use something called APS detectors, active uh, uh, pixel sensors, very much like the biological cameras, many, many, many pixels, but very poor dynamic range. And so this type of camera is good at recording millions of images with really low dynamic range. And that's sort of ideal for focused probe typography where you do electron counting. And you can see one of our diffraction patterns here in, in the uh, um, inset here. Whereas if you have a, a hybrid uh, uh, pixels, you, ha you have uh, um, the sort of thick integrating charge pixels like the MPAD detector, uh, um, that is, is way less pixels, but ultra high dynamic range. That tends to be a lot better for defocused probe typography. Um, but the, the short answer is we do both. This particular uh, um, study was very much a focused probe typography. And you can sort of see that based on how many, like every single pixel here in these images is a separate probe position. In defocused probe, you would, you would take much, much larger steps in between it and, and then just sort of reconstruct based on the dark field scattering information. Uh, happy to discuss in more detail offline. Good, thank you. So uh, I think uh, the the uh, questioners should contact you directly. I think. Yep. So I'm happy to I answer think... the Q and A offline too. Yeah. Right. So we will send you the Q and A, and if you could respond uh, uh, separately, that would be wonderful. Um, I think uh, in terms of time, we need to uh, probably wrap up. Uh, I would like to uh, thank both Peter and Colin for terrific uh, talks here. Uh, and uh, we will resume uh, the first Monday in December uh, with another exciting program. Uh, and I um, want to thank uh, uh, Ziwen and uh, uh, student Yi Che also for, for helping so much uh, get, this, uh, get this first one going. I really appreciate uh, their efforts. So I'll hand it back to Wa for one last comment, perhaps. Okay, Wa. I think that has been exciting two lectures to get our academic uh, year to begin. Um, so I do encourage people to come back again. There's a lot of interesting questions with the material presented today. And uh, the whole material will be on YouTube. I think it will be available probably within a few weeks uh, or even sooner. So people are welcome to, uh, to, uh, to look it over again and also encourage your colleagues to, uh, to watch it because these can be a very useful uh, educational materials. I personally use it for the lectures I give uh, instead of me giving the lecture, just watch the video, which is really more precise and, uh, and well presented. So I do encourage that we take advantage of these uh, uh, online resource. And I'd like to see is any uh, uh, final comment from Peter and, and Colin that you'd like to make? Uh, we can you. Yeah, I, I got a very important question for particularly the material science people because they don't use autogrids and they don't use clip ring then they have a site entry microscope in general. And so I thought I quickly share in, if you allow me in, in sure. one second, uh, in, 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 in one second, a uh, website of my friend, Henny Zandbergen. And Henny Zandbergen actually has built for the material, he's a material scientist from the Tel Aviv University, a retired professor who couldn't stop working. So he created his own company, Henny Z. You can have a look there. You can see this movie. He built a, for the site entry microscope a really good uh, high stable cryo holder. And that holder, he can fill with uh, clip ring grids and you can look at it in the microscope. And so uh, I think that for those who don't have a uh, Titan cryos or an Arctica or any of the machines that require an, uh, an autoloader, this is the way to go for a high resolution. And you can contact him if you like. And um, I, I just take this opportunity to share with the material scientists this particular opportunity so that you can have a look at it. 
and I like, gladly like to help you in case you cannot find him. I will be eager to help you with finding his email address. Now, th th that's very good because uh, what what you and I and myself have been collaborating with Professor Yi Che, and he's been doing terrific work using conventional uh, liquid nitrogen holders. And so uh, uh, Henny's uh, development will improve the resolution even more. So this is a, a good uh, development for material science. And combining yeah. the cryo EM with a, with a holder and all the things that we can do in physical science, like eels and STEM and 4D STEM, uh, combined with cryo is going to be fantastic in the future. Yeah, and he's very he also to help modifying the cryo holder for the chips that we are making, so the MEMS yeah. devices. And then you can have a look with the side entry holder. Yeah, no, this is very exciting because we like to look at the, the same grid in both microscope with uh, Titan cryos to our conventional way and subsequently put it in this uh, stem instrument to do chemical analysis and also other uh, types of imaging. So I, I think this is uh, truly exciting. I think the question is whether the software can help uh, such a, a, um, a studies because in biological material, particularly when you look, or even for the soft matter at low temperature, those tend to be beam sensitive. So uh, they can't load those imaging method. And so far, we've been using modifying the script in the serial EM, which is a it was developed by uh, David Masonati over in University of uh, Colorado in Boulder. And so something like that will be a really welcome trend. I think another way we are, we are doing is incorporate even the optical microscopy, <laughs> fluorescent microscopy, because there's certain material you may want to look at in the fluorescent optical mic microscope uh, to start with or after the, the EM uh, examination. So, so I yeah. think, the, and then, you know, we can extend all the way to the beam line too. So in fact, we are building a holder for the argon beam line. So you can do the, the auto grid, you know, the hold it uh, for the X-ray beam line. So at the end, I think we may want to have a multi-scale imaging modality of yeah, the right. same sample. And, and you know, sort of even a, a, a trivial thing like um, transferring from one microscope to another and then looking at exactly the same area and exactly right. the same cells or particles or protein molecules that is still a huge challenge, which uh, really needs to be uh, overcome. And it seems like a tech, well, it's straightforward technical solution, I would think, but. Right, right, right. Colin, do you have any final comments? Uh, not much other than to say anybody, any student, please feel free to email me and any students or PIs. Remember our facility is open access. And lastly, I'll just mention uh, any senior graduate students, there's a great program called SCGSR that will pay you to spend three to 12 months working in a national lab, for example, Berkeley lab, um, that I would strongly encourage anybody who wants to work at a beam line or electron microscopy facility as part of their senior uh, uh, couple years of their PhD, check out this program. It's incredibly valuable uh, offered by the Department of Energy. And can that be done for non-US uh, uh, students also? Sadly, no. Uh, it has to be US students for now. Okay. I, I would like the DOE to extend it to all students, but we'll see. Well, let, let's hope the, the world will, will uh, expand further. <laughs> so, uh, Wa, how about a final comment? And then uh, we should wrap up uh, with time. Colin has to get to ASU for a symposium. And Okay. Wa, I think, you. Yeah, I think I thank everyone again and uh, hope to see you in December before Christmas and after Thanksgiving. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank Have you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.